Hey everybody, welcome back to Sex, Drugs, and the Epigenome. I am back again with Dr. Seeds. Hi doc, how you doing? Doing well, doing well. Real excited about this podcast. Really excited about this episode as well. As you can see, we have a, a new face with us today. We have another fantastic interview with Dr. Dane Goodnow, PhD. He's a neuroscientist and so excited to get down to what we have today, which is all about the brain. That's my favorite, favorite topic of all the health topics is how do I get smarter than Dr. Seeds? That's the goal, right? That's all of our goals. All right, but first I have a couple of things to mention before we start diving into this fantastic interview. Uh, and that, that's our medical disclaimer. This is everything that you're hearing today is for educational purposes only. If you like to move forward with anything that is being discussed today, always, consult with your physician before moving forward. That said, we also have our upcoming Brain Summit this week. So excited. I'll give you more details about that at the end. But first, let's introduce you to Dr. Goodnow. And he is the inventor of advanced mass spectrometry technology platform in 1999 that has been used to analyze thousands of human samples from around the world and continues to be the most advanced technology of its kind today. Using this technology, he has established collaborations with world-renowned international researchers and physicians in dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, correctal can Correctal cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and several other diseases. Dr. Goodnow is an expert on the biochemical basis of disease, and his passion is targeted to optimizing the human biochemistry for longevity and vitality. And you can see why he is a friend of Dr. Seeds. Doc. Thank you Thank so you. much for having me. I'm really looking forward to Dallas and uh, meeting the team there. So. Awesome. All right. Well, today's interview is going to be done by Dr. Seed, so I'm going to hop off. But Doc, you're ready to roll. Well, thank you, Karen, for the introductions. And uh, Dr. Goodnow, I appreciate you so much in so many ways that I'm, I, I, I think um, I can't do you a good service or just service in my accolades for the the time you've put into your research and and what what I think you're going to bring to our our group here in Dallas, but more so what you've done to advance the science in uh, neurocognitive disease is just uh, it in, in my mind uh, this is Nobel Peace Prize stuff and uh, and I'm not kidding when I say that and and I I have. I have to, you know, full disclosure, uh, I've been following your research for a very long time. And I don't believe I paid enough attention to it. You know, our whole focus, let me just introduce it like this. And then I'm, I'm going to let you roll because you and I could just both talk forever. But, you know, we're, we've been so focused here in I think in aging in life on, on the big ticket things of looking at calorie restriction, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, all of these things that have been therapies to basically do what? Decrease glucose and kind of lead to changing metabolism, right? Changing more adipose lipolysis and uh, more hepatic ketogenesis, all the things to do to just to recreate the ability for the mitochondria to be more effective in mitochondrial oxidation and, and, and making ATP. And, and we've been focused on all of these really cool energy pathways and um, which we can go on at nauseum and which we will at the, at the, uh, at the brain summit. But but it, it it's all kind of led to this process that you know I, I think I think your neurocognitive work goes way beyond the brain. It's so integral to the fact that even with with all the things we know where we could potentially do some of these type of therapies to improve um, improve mitochondrial oxidation and ATP production, you know the bottom line is as we age, 
we lose the ability to really effectively metabolize glucose and we lose that NAD, NADH ratio that's so important in maintaining that flux through the mitochondria with, um, with the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And, and we get that, you know, eventual, the, the pyruvate, decar uh, what is it? The pyruvate decarboxylase um, ends up uh, complex ends up becoming less effective and, and we can't convert any of that. And so we just go back to glycolysis to make NAD. And so then we look at all of these ways, oh, what can we do to work around that? And that's kind of where we come in with peptides. We come in at looking at how we can change pathways and how we can do things to change the, the redox of the cell and improve the thermodynamic ratios that, that are all important. But we're missing something so important that makes so much sense in, um, in, in my privilege to having to, to had time and working with you and really getting to, to know you as a person and what your struggles and what you've done to get to where you're at in understanding the importance of the cell membrane and what you bring to the table with really understanding that fluidity of that cell membrane is everything. And it doesn't matter if we have these receptors working. It doesn't matter if we get that diet, you know, if we get that fasting right. It doesn't, it's all about these phospholipids and plasmologins that are just as important. And, and then I think putting that story together and, 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 and exposing, I, I think people will be, will have a new revelation of how they look at everything when it comes to efficiency of the cell, when we have a chance to put some things together down in Dallas. And, and if, if I could, and I've, I've talked too much, I, I would love for you to just kind of give your rendition of, of neurocognitive decline and, and what, where we've gone wrong and what your work has led to with this, this incredible way to look at the cell, which is so, I, I think, so complementary to what we've all been doing, but we just didn't realize was right in front of us and, and, and has so many implications just even outside of neurocognitive disease. So with that, I know I made that pretty open-ended, but it, it, well, it, 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 helps our, it helps our guys out, our people out there understand that there is I, I call it like the you, you, you're like the smoking gun that that nobody's paid attention to. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And it's interesting because this all started with the really complex technology with this non-targeted metabolomics and this ability to measure thousands and thousands of molecules simultaneously. And we get seduced by the complexity of biochemistry. And it's kind of fun in a sense, right? It's like, it becomes like a game of science of all these complexities of the human body. And as one system gets perturbed, it creates a whole cascade of additional complexities, right? Yeah. And in each of these complexities are interesting and they are valid to a certain point, right? And, and that's where I started with the non-target metabolomics technology is really understanding how we use biochemistry to diagnose disease and diagnose changes. But what was counterintuitive was that with increasing interpretation of a complexity, things started to be getting simpler and simpler because as we moved up the causation cascade, um, some of these systems became less complicated. Plasmalogens are one of those with the biological membrane. Like you mentioned, oxidative phosphorylation. And, and but I think we've, we've, we've forgotten, well, not forgotten. And for me, looking at more and more complexity, the, the actual concept of aging, I think people have a hard time with. They think it's programmed. They think it's, and over time and studying all these different biochemical mechanisms, aging becomes more like an overprotective parent like your genetics are there to kind of protect you and they basically protect you to death at the cellular level. And because you get insults, it's like that old movie, I can't even remember what it was called, where, where the parents put the little boy and like basically patted him up so badly they can't get hurt walking out the door. I can't remember, it's a goofy movie. But that's kind of what our cells do as we get older. 
they, they've had additional insults and they've, they've created protection mechanisms. So the one thing about being old versus young is we look at the young people and say how stupid they are because they, they, they feel fearless and they do a bunch of dumb stuff that we would never do as older people because we've learned better. But that's part of the young part is being feeling safe enough to do dumb stuff. And at the cellular level, we kind of have that as well because cells, as they get older, and they have more protective mechanisms. They've been too smart for their own good. They, they, they have to unlearn being old, unlearn being sophisticated, unlearn being smart, because part of being young is being dumb. And part of your cells being young is being dumb, is being able to be, be, be bold enough to make a mistake and feel like I can recover from a mistake that you don't recover from when you're older. And so as you move up the chain, the oxy oxidative phosphorylation, you know, the stress that our bodies have, maintaining mitochondrial function is absolutely critical. And then the mitochondrial function is where all of the oxidative stress of the human body originates, period. Okay, it's like you mentioned, the NAD, NADH ratio. As soon as the electron transport chain, like we're, we're, we're a hydrocarbon driven, we're a hybrid electric car. We, use, we burn hydrocarbons to charge a battery. The human body runs on electrochemical battery energy, just like an electric car does. An electric, that battery is that proton gradient of your electron transport chain. And just like you mentioned, if you can't keep that, that battery charged, it's gonna to go to glycolysis and you're gonna end up creating your NAD outside of the, the mitochondria in the cytosolic region and you know all the things that happen with that lactic acid and all that kind of stuff. And so we have to find a way to balance that. And one of those issues is once cells become damaged, they spit these electrons out and we have lots of mechanisms, right? The first thing is superoxide gets formed. And then from superoxide, we have a really stable superoxide dismutase system that neutralizes that typically or semi neutralizes it, right? We get oxygen, we get hydrogen peroxide, which is less damaging than superoxide, but still not the greatest thing for your body either. And so then we have this hydrogen peroxide that we either use glutathione peroxidase or catalase or plasmalogens. Plasmalogens are an actual um, neutralizer. Like most antioxidants, like a CoQ10, I call them like hot potato holders. Like they hold electrons until they can give away to someone else. Plasmalogens actually neutralize. They sacrifice themselves. They get consumed in the process. They have this special bond called the vinyl ether bond, and it protects your, your other polyunsaturates. So and when your cell membranes become oxidized, that becomes your chemoattracted signal to your immune system. So all, chron all chronic inflammation eventually gets led back to your mitochondria, okay? But you can, you can block that inflammation cascade with plasmalogens to prevent the, the peroxidation of the membranes. And that's why plasmalogen depletion with age happens twofold. One, we make less of them in our peroxisomes. And two, we end up consuming more of them because we have inherently higher oxidative stress. Um, so we actually... So it's a double whammy. We need more plasmalogens when we're older than we did when we're younger, and we make less than we did when we're younger. So we're, we're, we're in a negative mathematical equation on both ends as we get there. And so that's where the plasmalogen story began, identifying these plasmalogen deficiencies with age. And the interesting thing about plasmalogens is that we've known them, about them for about 100 years. We know for decades and decades and decades, there's, there's, there's like, I don't know how many, probably 10 inborn errors in metabolism diseases that affect plasmalogen biosynthesis, either at the peroxisome level as a whole or individual point mutations of plasmalogen biosynthesis. Every single one of these diseases are atrocious. They, the kids either die shortly after birth, very few of them will live to age 10. Dwarfism, they have cataracts, severe neurological dysfunction. Babies that are born prematurely often get bronchial dysplasia from their lungs, and that's primarily caused by being born before they've had sufficient plasmalogens from the mother. And so we have these, this, this, this link of plasmalogens in infancy has been known for decades. And so this late age-associated decline in plasmalogens is kind of a it's, it's, it's at the other end of the spectrum. It's some environmentally caused or whatever reason, we lose plasmalogens as we get older um, for multiple reasons. And then we have a whole different host of diseases. Uh, mortality, 
like the all cause mortality association with plasmalogens is one of the most scary things in the world. A 95 year old with high blood plasmalogens has the same probability of living to their 100th birthday as a 65 year old with low plasmalogens has of living to their 70th birthday. We're talking about a 30 year differential. And that's actually, actually after accounting for the effect plasmalogens have on cognitive impairment. Because if you get diagnosed with dementia, you, your, your, your all cause mortality goes up by two and a half. Like, so that getting dementia itself is an indicator of ab reduced health. And so the question becomes now, how is this happening at the biological membrane level? Like what's going on? And these plasmalogens are equally weird because you have lots of them, but you can't get any from your diet. Take like 20 to 30% of all the membrane lipids of the entire human body are these plasmalogens. And you get virtually none of them from your diet. None. You make all of them yourself from scratch. And so and it's, it's one of the strain, one of the rare situations. It's, it's really like a planned obsolescence, right? It's like creating a washing machine with a weak belt, with, you know, anticipating it failing in 20 or 30 years from now. And what's really been part of my, you know, luck in being in the right place at the right time and having the right aptitude to put, you know, the dots together was discovering this deficiency in plasmalogens, but more importantly, integrating 45 years of research, really good research, like especially for cognitive decline in the brain. Like we know so much about the brain. Like there has been such enormous advancements. Like we knew about the cholinergic issue with cognition, direct cholinergic in the 1970s, early 70s, okay? High correlations with cholinergic neuron synapses, like the choline of acetyltransferase, the enzyme that makes acetylcholine. Knew that in the early 70s, okay? Total correlation with cognitive decline, absolutely, okay? And we thought back then, hey, why can't we do something like Parkinson's and get some L-DOPA? And if we can get an L-DOPA version of choline, maybe we can actually treat Alzheimer's the same way we treat Parkinson's by having this biochemical precursor. The problem with dopamine works because the substantia nigra um, is a very small pea-sized organ and dopamine is only used in one aspect. Choline is everywhere. Choline is a core component of every single membrane of the human body. So how do you target choline to the nucleus basalis, right? Like it's just not physically possible. And they tried. They, they, they dope people up with so much choline, they were just, fish was seeping out of their pores, okay? Like this was not like, not for a lack of trying, right? Like IV injections, the whole nine yard. And so they couldn't get this precursor situation for choline. And, but we knew for a fact, there's a special enzyme called the choline high affinity transporter. And lots of studies have shown if you block, there's a drug called hemocholium-3. And if you block this choline uptake transporter, you cause autocannibalism. You, cholinergic neurons decrease, you reduce um, uh, acetylcholine nerve transmission. So, and we knew that back in the 80s and 90s, all this beautiful research. And then the first drug for Alzheimer's was Aricept. And it's a simple drug. It blocks acetylcholine esterase and it works. It doesn't decline the phase, but like clockwork, you improve acetylcholine in the synapse, you get an improvement of cognitive function. Okay, every single trial ever tried shows improved cognition. Problem is it doesn't change the rate of the, of the cholinergic neuron decline. But it wasn't until this group from uh, Ferguson and Blakely published a paper in the 90s showing that the choline high affinity transporter wasn't actually on the synaptic membrane. Okay, we're most like, so most neurotransmitters like, you know, serotonin and dopamine, and noradrenaline, they, the, the, the neuron exports this neurotransmitter, then it has these proteins on the presynaptic neuron to suck it back in again, to recharge the neuron. But in the cholinergic neuron, that reuptake protein isn't actually on the synaptic membrane. It's actually on the presynaptic vesicles. It's actually in the vesicle inside the membrane. And it only gets expressed when the neurotransmitters get released. And that happens via membrane fusion. And a whole different group of scientists were measuring what's causing, you know, what are the main membrane composition issues with membrane fusion? Well, it turns out 
you can't, membranes can't fuse unless they have plasmalogens in them. And the, 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 really, the ratio of plasmalogens completely determines the rate of membrane fusion. So now we have basically the plasmalogens are the equivalent or plasmalogen deficiency is the equivalent of hemocolumin three, basically. We have a very clean and clear mechanism by how a, a biochemical defect essentially blocks choline uptake into the membrane. And if you block choline uptake into the synaptic membrane, the, the synaptic bouton now has to make all of its choline de novo. And how does it do that? Methyltransferase, phosphatidylethanolamine methyltransferase, good old fashioned, you know, SAH, homocysteine. If you, everyone was talking about why homocysteine is correlated with Alzheimer's disease, you look no further than the making of choline because that's a big, big sink of homocysteine levels. And the other place that you have choline is actually in the membrane, the phosphatidylcholine. So what does it do? It sucks choline off of its membranes and, the, and you get membrane shrinkage. And so this stuff has all been worked out. And so what happens now with when we do post-mortem studies in the brain, humans, the correlation with cognitive function and plasmalogens, DHA plasmalogens, it's insane. Like it is like, it is a scary, scary graph. Like we're talking like with the, the, the um, global cognition variable that we use at Rush University, it's on a log scale. And it goes from a plus four to a minus one in physiological concentrations of DHA plasmalogen in the human brain. It is an insane number. It gets the p-value of 10 to the minus six. This is a small group, five, whatever it is, small group of people. And every one standard deviation change in plasmalogen in the brain is a five-fold change in dementia diagnosis. It's really a stupid number. And so it, and it, and it's, and it's a very simple, mechanism. And so the trick was, how the heck do we get these plasmalogens into humans? And then that's another part where I'm lucky because I'm a synthetic organic chemist. And so I designed these plasmalogen precursors that could bypass this gut microbiome, gut metabolism perspective, because this vinyl ether bond is designed to be, to neutralize peroxides. So it's designed by the body to blow up as soon as it hits acid. And so obviously your stomach is full of hydrochloric acid pH of two at, at times. And so soon, if you eat a nice juicy steak that has plasmalogens in it, or, you know, a, a cow heart or something like you're, that's going to hit your stomach acids and it just goes to, it just gets burnt, burst up. So you can't get it in. So I created these alkyl acyl glycerols that don't have the vinyl to bond. They're only one step up the biochemical pathway. So they, they survive your gut, they get absorbed, and lo and behold, these things are complete neuroprotectants. We can't, we give animals neurotoxins like MPTP, we can't kill their dopaminergic neurons. We treat them with Cooper's zone, which is a massive demyelinating, high inflammatory. We can't even demyelinate them. In fact, we can give them the, the, the demyelination, continue giving them the Cooper zone while they're still on Cooper zone. We give them the plasmalogen precursors and the mice remyelinate in the presence of Cooper's own. It's, it's absolutely insanity. And so now we have it in humans. So for the first time in seriously a hundred years, we can actually target these plasmalogens in humans. We ran a clinical trial here in California, um, small group, 22 people for four months. We got a statistically significant improvement in cognition and a statistically significant improvement in sarcopenia measures of the sense in, in, in an end size of 22. Okay, it's just, it's crazy. And so people are using it, it's working, and it's a simple mechanism. And I tell people my job overall in life is the simple stuff, like the mitochondrial help, like you mentioned, basic membrane structure. There's a bunch of other, so plasmalogens are great because they're kind of a Trojan horse. Like you can get people hooked on them and say, hey, this is important, wake up. And oh, by the way, while I'm fixing your plasmalogens, let me take a look at your mitochondria health a little bit here. Let me make sure you're, you're not phosphatidylcholine deficient because people that are strict vegetarians aren't eating proper foods. And, and so we can fix a few other things while we're at it. So while I got you in the, in the, in the shop here fixing your brakes, let me get a couple other things fixed while, you're, while your car is on the, on the jack here. And so that's kind of what we do. And, um, and then when you're dealing with actual disease issues like ALS and Parkinson's, and you have to really deal with some serious regeneration and regrowth 
the stuff that you guys are doing with the peptides and the ability to say, okay, can we get this base health figured out, the biochemical nutrient health? And then we can kind of up the volume now. We can say, now we can say, okay, now, now that we got the, you know, it's like, there's, there's no need to fix upholstery and in, in, in windshield wipers if you're out of oil. And so we, we want to get the basic operation done and then let's get all these key things, which are not, I, I didn't mean it in that, in a derogatory way. I meant like there's all, we want to rebuild membranes in ALS. We want to rebuild substantia nigra and Parkinson's. And we want to rebuild these things. Sometimes you're going to need a little extra boost, not just basic plasmalogens and um, nutrients. So at least that way we should, you know, in, we can, I'm excited about kind of this combined therapy approach. But yeah, so that's my, that's kind of how it, it's kind of weird because you get from one, you start big, you start with all this complexity and then you learn how stupid you are and you think you got these great hypotheses and then these hypotheses don't turn out to be true and then you fix them and then you, you go back to the drawing board and you beat your head against the wall again for another five years and then you finally figure something else out. And that's kind of where it comes to right now. And, and I think in long-term, this whole aging and entropy thing is coming into play because it's, that's what the mitochondria is. It's kind of a, it's, the, it's the defiance of the second law of third dynamics. Sure. It's, you know, you're basically sticking a, like you got, you got controlled fire going on inside your cells and, and you got to kind of keep that fire burning so that it can energize and heat everything else around you. And you've got to do that in such a way that you don't burn your fingers. And I think that's the, that's the fun part. And there's so the tools that we're getting, the, the tools that we have now, it's good. It's, we're really on a, on a, on a, in a, in a great trajectory. So I'm pretty excited to, to play, to, you know, start pushing the, pushing the envelope here and there. Well, I, I would call this, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to call this as your tipping point because you, all your hard work is, it, it's going to be my job to, to blow, blow the whistle for you because there's just no getting around the number one, the synergy of what, what we're going to bring out here, but what you've done. I mean, I, I just in, you know, just in the basics of looking at, at the, you know, the biochemistry of how you evaluate um, cell structure, just with your lab, you know, the lab requirements that you look at, you know, I learned a tremendous amount about just under a, a finally that, that statement has always been validated to me. You know, I knew that, okay, if I'm working on, if I'm working on methylation and I know I've got issues with high methylation, just because I fix folate and B12 and so forth doesn't mean I fixed the problem. And I think so many of us get lost in that. And, and you really bring into light where you can actually see, well, okay, there's a reason you're methylating for, you know, other, other, uh, other, other things like ceramides and so forth, but Hey, look, you've lost Hey, bill. Look at, look at these, uh, phosphatidylcholamines and, and ethanolamines that you've lost. You need lecithins. I mean, bill, this is telling you a story. You haven't fixed a damn thing. I mean, and I mean, good old that, fashioned, good old fashioned creatine. That like, yes, that but that's, you forget these some of these super simple molecules. Like right. your body makes massive amounts of creatine every day, and it's a combination from your kidney and your liver, and it's methyltransferase. Okay, and good, just get good old fashioned creatine in the elderly, um, even if they don't even think they need it. Um, exactly, some of these simple things, um, you know, and. And then, and also there's a, there's also the there's a there's a business side to it right because some of these simple things you need to be able to provide it with people but you kind of have to combine it with something that is able to grow in the community because products and getting to people and getting people to recognize the value in things you know it's um, like just having the right answer it always isn't you know, there's, there's a, there's a human psychology of helping people. Um, and, and I think that's where some of these simple nutrients, getting a simple blood test, getting mechanisms and protocols that doctors can then implement into their practice, feedback mechanisms so their patients can actually see differences. That's the other thing I find people remember health. Okay. They don't remember sickness so much. 
And so when they get better, they don't always know they're better because they remember they're like they used to be, right? And so they kind of, they, they, and so you kind of have to show people, well, this is what you were six months ago. Okay, yeah, I know it's, I know here's where you were 10 years ago. Okay, but I'm, I'm talking last six months. So we've got you better for six months now. And so, and, and so the, I think there's a, there's a salesman perspective of saying, look, good job. Look what you've done to yourself. You're better. We can show you that you're better. Keep doing this because behavioral modification in your diet, even taking supplements, because you know you can get a whole like sticking to protocols is not, you know, the higher you know we always get a slice of people that are that are very dedicated to getting things done, but it's it's we all jump off the wagon on, on maintaining our protocols. So there's a there's a component of this of trying to. How do, how do we help people get healthy? And then, and obviously it benefits us by, because we show that our protocols are working, so. No, absolutely. I, I think you've, I think you hit it on the head about the people forget, you know, once they're healthy, they forget what it was, where they were. And, and that's no different than when, you know, from until, until we get more specific without, indirect testing. And, and that's kind of like a, why I like a lot of your lab work um, with, with the information it gives me and, and where I can go with it. But where, where we're focused on doing really significant things and, and trying to improve mitochondrial health and, and so forth, you know, our best way still today is, our, is looking at, at really objective data like in body where we can show body partitioning and we can actually show people, hey, this is where you started with your fat mass and this is where you are now. And, and that's powerful because you can't, you can't fool that, you know, it, it's like doing, a, I mean, if you want to get more specific, it's, it's uh, doing a, a bone density study specifically to look at muscle and, and bone. But there's another simple test, like peripheral nerve conductivity, like we're seeing significant people saying my, my diabetic neuropathy is gone. Right. Okay optic neuritis gone right okay and so if that's happening yeah. the peripheral nerve conductivity has to get better like the, the 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 white matter protective the the has to be getting better and so we can measure that kind of stuff and those are other good objective measurements and there's some better measurements of balance too for like the neurological requirements of maintaining balance and there's better quantitative tools so these I, I, this is the kind of thing that we do the biochemistry and we can show that we get, we, it's powerful, the testing, obviously, and we can tell people where to go, but it's still intellectual for most people. Correct. Right? It's, it's an intellectual, you're changing a number on, on a chart. Correct. And, um, and we still want to, like you just mentioned, so how, what's the physiological, um, you know, biomarkers that we can show people. Right. And, and because that's, because your brain can only get you so far intellectualizing, like you have to still feel better. You have to still kind of look better, okay? There's a, it's not enough just to have your biomarkers get better. For some people it is, but for a lot of people, you still have to kind of get the, there needs to be kind of a visceral feeling. And so when right. people see better vision, lots of like at our age group, like for me, my short-term vision all came back unexpectedly. And so I don't need glasses now for anything within four feet. I still right. need my glasses to drive. And I hear that from a lot of people now. And because the, the retina of your eye have such high levels of these DHA plasma allergens. So again, we're, you know, the, the, the shiny object of cog is cognition, clearly. That's the number one big driver and mobility because your neuromuscular junction is fundamentally the same neuron as in your brain. It's a cholinergic neuron. Instead of it connecting to typically glutaminergic, it's, to, it's connecting to a nerve muscle. But it's the same machinery, just bigger. Um, and I think that's why it was a bit surprising to see that huge sarcopenia reduction, like with the sit stand, um, it was kind of in the protocol. We had people, several of them, they had between four and five additional sit stands. Like, see, this is a 30 second sit stand test. So you get people sit on a chair, you stopwatch, and you ask them to stand up and sit down as many times as they can in 30 seconds. Most people are between, between 10 and 30 at the max, right? very rare to get 30, like you're in that 20 range. But we had people going from a 10 to a 15, 11 to 12, 16. Like that's a lot of sit-stand improvements in a four-month period. And 
but it, but it makes sense. It I makes mean, sense. It makes sense, right? You know? <laughs> it, it, and, 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 and that's the kind of, that's the other thing is that we get, we get um, sucked into believing that nothing works anymore. Right. 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 We, 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 we expect failure now right. in right. science. Like we, 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 and so when everything, some, when something does work, we, we're, we're, we're geared to disbelieve it. Right. So. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you something I had, gosh, what, what really gets me excited about all your work and, and, and finally getting to work closely with you and, and discuss a lot of our thoughts and, and get you now to this meeting, which I, I can't wait for. Um, is I, I don't know if it was six, seven years ago at one of our big meetings, I made the statement of, you know, peptides are, or cell signaling, whether it's peptides, supplements, uh, small molecules, it's, it's, it's the beginning of bridging that gap from like developmental biology to where we're at with aging and, um, in that process. And I was missing, I was missing something that I couldn't put my hands around, but it was in front of me the whole time. And, and that is what you're doing. That is, that and the is. And cell signaling is so important. The, the switching of our cells from the, the glycolysis to lipolysis every day. Okay. All, all these age-related diseases, this in, the cancers, and it's not just one, all different cancers all have the same age. All cancers are derived from the inability of a cell to maintain its fasting state. Period. Right. Abs period. A cell, if a cell can go into a fasting state on a regular basis, it will never ever become cancerous. Period. And so if you can maintain that fasting state, okay, and your body is supposed to switch from a fed to a fasting every day, in the fed state, it's all catabolic. We're, we're consuming things. It's like having your iPhone on all day long. And at nighttime, you put it in the recharger. And at nighttime, we're anabolic. And that's our natural fasting ketogenic state. That's when the peroxisomes turn on. That's when your mitochondrial beta oxidation turns on. That's when you're making your steroids. If you're making your hormones, you're making, you're rebuilding everything during that fasting state. And if you're not fasting, if your body doesn't get in the fasting state, it can't build. It can't make plasmalogens. It can't make membranes. It can't, it, it doesn't know it's, it's lost. And, and so, yeah, so this basic cellular chemistry and as we get older, when we're young, a couple, couple hours between meals and we're already in the fasting state because we consume a lot of energy. But when we're older, we need more hours. We need longer caloric restriction for our cells to properly switch into the fasting state. And so and, you know, these are basic things that we take for granted because you know, the body is so, it, it is so resilient, right? Like we can abuse it so badly for so many years and we get away with so much for so long. And um, it's, uh, it's hard to kind of it really. You know, it's so. amazing. And I, and I, you know, I think, um, I think this has been awesome. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to just give us a little precursor to some, I think some amazing discussion that we're going to have that's going to be Gonna, you know, we're we're all. I like what you said. We're all about giving answers. We're all about giving um, processes that have absolute validity in what they can do to change the cell. And and the focus of this is is really, as I I've always said, it's you know the secret to redox is is the secret of making the cell work the right way. And that's basically what we're talking it's about. Fundamental right? core of, of life, yeah. fundamental core of life. Okay. <laughs> we are electrochemical run organism. That's what we, we return sunlight energy back to the universe. And how we do that is through our mitochondria. And, so, well, and, and I think, you know, I, I can't, I think we're going to, I'm going to make a prediction and I could, I could be wrong, but I'm, I rarely am when I make these predictions, we're going to go, further with a lot of these discussions because we're going to we're going to keep feeding off of each other in in what yeah. what we can bring to the public and and what questions you know both i really i want to say another thing that i really love about what you do in your teaching is you approach it you know i you approach it in a way that is is very humbling and that is you love questions and you always know hey we don't have all the answers all the time 
But those questions lead us to other thoughts and they lead us to other ways of getting to maybe think about something else that wasn't even part of that question. But new thing, you know, it's like going down rabbit holes that just open up. And, yeah. and I, I really appreciate that with, with the well, way- Well, we have to learn as experts is to, we have to teach ourselves not to be experts because we all build bias. Right. right? We, we build a bias up, right? right. And right. if you're an expert, you can't be taught. You can't teach an expert anything because an expert already knows everything. And so you have to kind of, you have to detrain yourself into constantly treating yourself as the student and as being ignorant. You know, and 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 the, the because it's so it's so easy as we get older, we have so many patterns of previous behavior. We've seen so much, and it's so easy for us to automatically pick a previous pattern of science or previous outcome of result, and we just rather than thinking through it, we just choose from previous experiences. And that's, it, and that's where bias comes in. It's like, it's like going to university course and always going to sit in the same chair. It takes less energy. I don't want to think about where to sit every time I go to the, my, my thing. I, I know where my chair sits. I'm going to go sit in the chair. I don't want to think twice about it. Why, why would I think about where to sit every damn day? Right. <laughs> and so, and that's bias, right? It's because it, it, it's, it's, and it's lazy, but it's also efficient. And so that's the efficiency of our thinking as we get older, but that efficiency comes with a cost. We're, we're less plastic and it's hard to, it's, it's, it's uh, like the last thing I ever want to become is an expert because then I don't, I can't learn anything. It's, that's so true. When I start, every time I start my, some of my courses, most of them, I always tell everybody, I know about this much <laughs> and there's a lot more to learn. Yeah. So so that 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 I don't think you said I can't say it any better than what you said and and that's and I always tell people when you hear somebody say that they really have this figured out and they are the expert I say wait a second maybe you need to run away from that person because there's always more to the story right yeah or just put a little for now I got to figure it out for now <laughs> I love it <laughs> <laughs> my goodness um i i can see why this this match between you two great minds is is so is so strong um from the get-go dr jane and dr seed had been uh working uh very very harmoniously together and it was so funny doc i forgot to mention when his his team reached out to us for the first time i'm like hey do you know this doctor and normally you're always like, oh, no, 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 no. But then this, when when I mentioned your name, Dr. Goodnow, his eyes lit up. He's like, who? Who is that again? <laughs> and I totally forgot that. We were in, we were, uh, in the same office, Doc, if you recall. Oh, um, very good stuff. Um, I, I love what Dr. Seeds was saying about this potential. I don't know if we glassed over it, but I would like to repeat what Dr. Seed said earlier about Dr. Goodnow, which is the potential Nobel Peace Prize material. Um, the that's ab fellows. That's, that's absolutely that's absolutely valid saying that. That's You're in for a treat. Come Dallas. Uh, Brain Summit is coming up this weekend, August 20th through the 21st. We will be out there in Dallas. Unfortunately, uh, our live tickets are 100% sold out but you can still join us live on the live stream as well as the recordings that we will most certainly pick up for you. Um, I love that one, one last thing that I, I loved about what you were saying, Dr. Goodnow, was yes, what your research does, it helps to get us closer to finding solutions for big neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but also you're talking about just regular people wanting to improve cognition. I guess my, my, my first of many questions for our last one of the day is, how soon would you start this kind of plasmologin treatment in people? Well, it depends. Like, so me, I'm in my fifties. It's at any point in time. And so um, typically, because using population dynamics is always a dangerous thing because everyone ages and has different life experiences. Like, so if you're for maternal health, for example, so all pregnant women should be on plasmalogens because hundred percent of the fetus requires plasmalogens from the mother. So when mothers get this foggy brain, some of the issues that they have, um, those are big issues. Young in autism, like the, the plasmalogen issue with autistic children is a whole different situation because of inflammatory uh, mitochondrial disease issues. Autism is hundred percent environmental. So those are those issues. But if you're a woman with breast cancer, young, 
Okay, you're going to need plasma allergens because I've got a paper coming out with the group in Kyoto with the next few weeks. We just got approval from the editorial board on it um, before and after surgical removal for breast cancer. Um, so if you have, if you're going undergoing liver disease, so there's certain things about plasma allergens that when you're younger, you naturally have ability to make a lot of them and you build reserve capacity, probably up until our forties and fifties on average, the human brain actually doesn't really mature till mid fifties. Okay. We are full, our white matter tracks don't actually fully develop until, you know, in our, in our mid to late fifties. And so, so it's true. Young people are stupid, but anyways, we get there. And so the, the, <laughs> the um, but so the, the, so it depends on what you what's going on in your life experience. But for most of us, yeah, as we get in our 50s and 60s, and, and certainly postmenopausal women, we, we want to get there because they lose that beta estradiol protection that they have. It's such a powerful neural protectant when they're when they're young. That is fantastic. And, and just hearing you talk about the things that I've, I've heard Dr. Seed say over and over and over again, like the simple stuff, diet, nutrition, and you're mentioning simple things like creatine, love, love, love. I love that it doesn't require a prescription. It just requires just like- And having said that, there's people in their nineties that have beautiful brains, okay? Mm -hmm. They have no tangles, no amyloid, high blood plasma allergens. Now, exactly how they got there through 90 years of, of living on this earth is still a mystery. Okay. Wow. It could be just a random luck that they just kind of somehow navigated through, not taking any Tylenol for pain, this and that, had the right diet. So we have these pathways, like, so it's not impossible. Okay. They're, they're, and so, the, and that's what people have to remember. It only takes one observation to destroy a hypothesis. One. Okay. If one observation does not match your hypothesis, your hypothesis is dead. Okay. Go back to the drawing board. And so when we see these people, these old people with beautiful brains, it's possible to have a disease-free brain into your 90s, okay? We may not know how to do it for everybody, but the fact is that it's there, okay? And we're just not smart enough to figure out how that happened and reproduce it in other people. But that's reality. We just can't just throw our hands up in the air and say, well, we're just getting old and you're all going to die sometime. And, um, you know, like that's the odds, but that's not a foregone conclusion. Not, not accepting it, not accepting it. Well, it gives us something to constantly work towards. And right. Of, right, right, right. If you're listening and you've not Googled, where do I get plasmologens now? <laughs> Join us in Dallas. It is, uh, uh, email us info at ssrpinstitute.org. Dr. Dayan now is, is the founder of po Prodrome Sciences. Go check out his book, Breaking Alzheimer's. Um, in addition to all of his other research that he, he writes about in his blog and in his classes. Oh my gosh, we're so excited to learn more from you both uh, this weekend. Thank you all so much for joining us for this hour and we will see everyone again in about two weeks and hope to see you online. Brain Summit. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.